Dear most loving Heavenly Father, Lord, it's a privilege once again, after all so many travels, to be here again in your house that we can worship together in spirit and in truth. Please empty me, Lord, of self, I pray, and fill me with your Holy Spirit, that all things said and presented here today will be to your glory and, and no one else, especially not me. Please, Lord, I pray that you would touch each, each heart, that you would send your Holy Spirit to um, dwell within each and every one of us that is willing to receive your Holy Spirit and grant us the wisdom, discernment, the foresight, the knowledge that we need to take in this message here this morning. Because we ask and pray all things in Jesus' name and for your sake. And also, please be with Edwin, I believe, is still en route. I pray that you be with him and uh, all the others that couldn't make it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are studying still in Desire of Ages. And today we are on chapter 7, As a Child. Jesus as a Child. Uh, it's, it's really neat that we have this added information from the spirit of prophecy so that we have a little bit better understanding of what went on in Christ's um, childhood and his youth growing up because scriptures are pretty well silent. There's not a whole lot that, uh, that the Bible says, but even that is, is a lesson in itself and we'll, we'll see that here today. So let's go ahead without any delay, let's go ahead and get into this study at this time. Jesus as a child. And here's one of the few scriptures that talk about his childhood. It's Luke 2 and verse 40. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. The childhood and youth of Jesus were spent in a little mountain village. There was no place on earth that would not have been honored by his presence. You know, the whole earth should have been rallying to have him there in their presence, but uh, instead he ends up in this small little mountain village. The palaces of kings would have been privileged in receiving him as a guest, but he passed by the homes of wealth, the courts of royalty, and the renowned seats of learning to make his home in obscure and despised Nazareth. Nazareth was, was um, a, 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 a really, it, it, was, it was full of, of wickedness, really. It was a wicked town and uh, did not have the respect at all of the leadership of, of Christ's day. It was full of uh, a lot of um, temptations and things of that nature. So again, it really, we'll get into it more as we go along. This is Desire of Ages, page 68, first chapter. Wonderful in its significance is the brief record of his early life. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. In the sunlight of his father's countenance, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Luke 2.52 His mind was active and penetrating with a thoughtfulness and wisdom beyond his years. So even though he was a, a, a little child, uh, he, was, he was very thoughtful and his wisdom uh, was much greater than those of his peers in the same age group. Yet his character was beautiful in its symmetry. The powers of mind and body developed gradually in keeping with the laws of childhood. The laws of childhood. What kind of laws do you think that's uh, referring to? The laws of childhood. Anyone have a response? Anyone have a thought? I just thought that's an interesting statement there. The laws of childhood. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, children can only be so smart at a certain age. They can only have so much wisdom and so much understanding at a certain age. But I, I think on the scale, Jesus, I'm sure, pretty much topped out the scale. The, the, the most uh, wisdom, understanding, um, thoughtfulness, kind, lovingness, all these things, all these attributes that, that we are born with, um, Jesus excelled, obviously. As a child, Jesus manifested a peculiar loveliness of disposition. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. 
How often do we see that in youth today, willing, and, and, and even in ourselves? He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb and a truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. It was never worthwhile for him to lie in any way to sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. Boy, I just, you know, I think I'm probably not alone. Most of us would love to have all of those attributes um, credited to us and we can have those but we have to strive and, and work at it just as Jesus did ultimately uh, with deep earnestness the mother of Jesus watched the unfolding of his powers and beheld the impress of perf perfection upon his character it was he was just uh, just absolutely perfect in every way it's amazing with delight she sought to encourage that bright receptive mind through the Holy Spirit, she received wisdom. So not only was Christ um, receiving wisdom from the Holy Spirit, his mother, who was teaching him, also received wisdom as well. To cooperate, let me back up, through the Holy Spirit, she received wisdom to cooperate with the heavenly agencies in the development of this child, who could claim only God as his father. God was the only father that he had on this earth. Desire of Ages 69.1. From the earliest times, the faithful in Israel had given much care to the education of the youth. It was very important to educate those youth. The Lord had directed that even from babyhood, the children should be taught of his goodness and his greatness, especially as revealed in his law and shown in the history of Israel. So what was it important, most important? especially as revealed in his law. Always it comes down to the law of the Lord, which of course is his character. Song and prayer and lessons from the scriptures were to be adapted to the opening mind. Fathers and mothers were to instruct their children that the law of God is an expression of his character, God's character, and that as they received the principles of the law into the heart, the image of God was traced on mind and soul. Much of the teaching was oral, but the youth also learned to read the Hebrew writings and the parchment rolls of the Old Testament scriptures were open to their study. So I thought that was uh, a little interesting that, that a lot of his teachings, or the, actually it sounds like most of it was just orally given, and I'm sure that he hung on every word that his mother uh, told him and uh, taught him. Um, and, and recorded these things in his mind, and he was able to have a, an awesome memory, of course. We know he quoted scripture all throughout his life. And, of course, he also studied the, the actual scriptures, the Hebrew writings. So he, he was getting a great education, something that he could not have gotten from the institutions of his day. In the days of Christ, the town or city that did not provide for the religious instruction of the young was regarded as under the curse of God. Wow. If, if you could not have a school to go to, to attend to, then the whole city or town was under the curse of God. God was actually cursing that town. Do you think that's right? I don't think so at all. That's, that's not accurate at all. That was something that was impressed upon the people because of the leaders of the day, right? True education would lead the youth to seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, Acts 17.27. But the Jewish teachers gave their attention to matters of ceremony. The mind was crowded with material that was worthless to the learner and that would not be recognized in the higher school of the courts above. I wonder if that's going on in our schools today. I wonder if, if, if the minds of, of children are being filled with worth, worthless information. I can remember when I was going to Southern, um, it was kind of sad because the, I think looking back on it, the really good teachers that were adhering to our fundamental principles were being shunned and ostracized while the more popular ones, the ones that the kids really liked and, and flocked to, because why? 
they were telling them all the things that they wanted to hear. Um, I know that was true for me, for sure. And so, you know, we would, we would be drawn to those teachers rather than the ones that were really upholding the truth. It's happening today, I promise you, in our schools. The experience which is obtained through a personal acceptance of God's word had no place in the educational system. Hmm. Absorbed in the round of externals, the students found no quiet hours to spend with God. We need to have that time to, to, to be set apart that we can go out and experience being in nature and, and really uh, getting a good connection with our Lord and Savior. They did not hear his voice speaking to the heart. In their search after knowledge, they turned away from the source of wisdom. Hmm. So rather than being drawn to God, who is truly the best teacher that, uh, that could ever exist, uh, they're drawn away from God and taught by these uh, other supposedly great teachers of the day. The great essentials of, of the service of God were neglected. The principles of the law were obscured. That which was regarded as superior education was the greatest hindrance to real development. Under the training of the rabbis, the powers of the youth were repressed. Their minds became cramped and narrow. What a sad state of affairs that you would go I mean, even parents, you, you, the parents would send their children to the schools of the day, the rabbinical institutions of the day, thinking that their children were going to get a higher education, but actually what they're being, uh, what's, what's actually being taught them is cramping and narrowing their minds. How sad. Would you, would you like that? Would you like to pay for an education, to pay high, top dollar for an education like that? Do you see the parallels between what was happening there and what is happening today? Um, I, I promise you these, these types of uh, activities are probably even worse today than they were in Christ's time. Who actually did teach him? The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. Okay. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. Isn't that awesome? I think that's just incredible. The, the very same things that he actually said, he had to be taught them as a child. I think that's awesome. That's just incredible. As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources for, who was his instructor? God. How many teachers did he have? He just had two. He had a human teacher, but God was really his instructor. Even through the human, that was an instrument for the Lord to work through, his mother. Awesome. The question asked during the Savior's ministry, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned? This does not indicate that Jesus was unable to read, but merely that he had not received a rabbinical education. And if you did not receive a rabbinical education, you were not qualified to teach anything. That's what they were saying. How can, how can, this, how can this, this young lad uh, have any wisdom and understanding whatsoever? He, didn't, he hasn't gone to our schools. Yes. Yes. You can't be a pastor unless you go to college and do the seminary and all of that. Right, that's, that's exactly what I was told. I, I, um, I went and met with uh, the ministerial director at the time at the conference office, uh, the pastor of the church, of uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church that we were attending, uh, accompanied me there because he saw in me um, uh, a, a, a talent, I guess, that, um, that he thought was was something that could be used for the Lord. So he went with me and accompanied me and, and kind of, I guess, vouched for me, whatever you want to say. But I was refused any kind of position whatsoever. I had to go to, I had to go back to school. And then once I finished a four-year degree, then I had to go on for a two, two uh, go on additional two more years at the seminary to get um, that degree as well. So, yeah, it's it's not... No, it's very, 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 very expensive. And um, 
And we know what they get taught there. It's mandatory for spiritual formation to be um, taught all the children, uh, the students. Since he gained knowledge, as we may do, his intimate acquaintance with the scriptures shows how diligently his early years were given to the study of God's word, how important it is for us to be studying God's word, even as children. You know, so often we think of, you know, well, um, the kids, you know, they just, they just need to um, play with felts, and I'm not saying, not belittling these things necessarily, but, you know, sometimes I think we underestimate how much children can learn and how quickly they can pick up on it um, if they're instructed and taught in the right way. I, I've seen it. I've seen many kids that were very sharp in Scripture at a very young age. And spread out before him was the great library of God's created works. So not only the Word of God, but also in creation. Um, he who had made all things, who is he that made all things? Jesus, right? Studied the lessons which his own hand had written in earth and sea and sky. I mean, I mean do, you, do, you, do you understand, fathom, what's happening here? You, you have a little baby who actually created everything, who instructed the Israelites, who inspired the, the writers of the Bible, and he is the one learning from the very things that uh, he himself has done. That's incredible to me. Uh, it seems almost impossible. It's amazing what God can do. Apart from the unholy ways of the world, he gathered stories of scientific knowledge from nature, and that's true science, of course, not the pseudoscience we see today. He studied the life of plants and animals and the life of man. From his earliest years, he was possessed of one purpose. He lived to do what? To bless others. He lived to bless others. That was his whole purpose in life. For this, he found resources in nature. New ideas of ways and means flashed into his mind as he studied plant life and animal life. Continually, he was seeking to draw from things seen, illustrations by which to present the living oracles of God. These are things that, uh, that we all need to learn, but um, those in positions of, of um, leadership should really, really understand them. This is, this is really a, a, a rebuke to pastors <laughs> that we need to be, we, we need to be learning from, from nature things to illustrations to uh, help um, others to come to a closer walk with Christ. Continually, he was seeking to draw from things seen, illustrations by which to present the living oracles of God, the parables by which during his ministry he loved to teach his lessons of truth show how open his spirit was to the influences of nature and how he had gathered the spiritual teaching from the surroundings of his daily life. This is our of Ages 70.2. So from his daily life he drew all these spiritual teachings. We should be, that's, that's an that's a example for us as well, that we need to draw from our daily lives, the surroundings, that um, we can use these things to teach others. Thus to Jesus the, the significance of the Word and the works of God was unfolded. They were one in the, they just meshed perfectly together. As he was trying to understand the reason of things, heavenly beings were his attendants, and the culture of holy thoughts and uh, communings was his. From the first dawning of intelligence, he was constantly growing in spiritual grace and knowledge of truth. Every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did. What? I'm sorry, what did that say? How many children? Every. Do you think that means every? All of them? Yes. Every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did. He did not have any special advantage over, over any of us. I mean, I know that there's certainly learning disabilities, but I believe that God will even bless in those cases if prayed about um, and uh, follow his, his, uh, his examples. As we try to become acquainted with our Heavenly Father through His Word, angels will draw near. Our minds will be strengthened. Our characters will be elevated and refined. See, that, that's, that's the recipe. That's what we need to do. We shall become more like our Savior, and as we behold the beautiful and grand in nature, our affections go out after God. 
While the spirit is awed, the soul is invigorated by coming in contact with the infinite through his works. Communication with God through prayer develops the mental and moral faculties, and the spiritual powers strengthen as we cultivate thoughts upon uh, spiritual things. I don't know how we can think that we're going to have a close connection with God if we're not praying and uh, using our mental and moral faculties in that, uh, in that capacity. The life of Jesus was a life in harmony with God. While he was a child, he thought and spoke as a child, but no trace of sin marred the image of God within him. So you see, that's the laws of childhood right there, is when he was a child, he still thought as a child, but uh, he still had no sin, no trace of sin in him. Yet he was not exempt from temptation. The inhabitants of Nazareth were proverbial for their wickedness. You see, Nazareth was a very wicked city, little town. The low estimate in which they were generally held is shown by Nathaniel's question, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? John 1, 4, 6. Jesus was placed where his character would be tested. So he wasn't placed in a, a position where he had some advantage and uh, would not be tested um, as we would possibly be tested. He was put into the worst circumstances, the worst surroundings, and yet he came out and came through that experience with a perfect character. Uh, Jesus was placed where his character would be tested. It was necessary for him to be constantly on guard in order to preserve his purity. He was subject to all the conflicts which we have to meet that he might be an example to us in childhood, youth, and manhood. Otherwise, how could he be a true example to us, right? If he wasn't tested as we get tested, he couldn't be uh, the, the, the true example that he was. Satan was unwearied in his efforts to overcome the child of Nazareth. Again, I think it's kind of interesting that Satan thought that he would be able to overcome him. But... Nonetheless, that didn't discourage him one ounce, one bit. He still did everything he could to destroy Christ. From his earliest years, Jesus was guarded by heavenly angels, yet his life was one long struggle against the powers of darkness. That there should be upon the earth one life free from the defilement of evil was an offense and a perplexity to the prince of darkness. He left no means untried to ensnare Jesus. No child of humanity will ever be called to live a holy life amid so fierce a conflict with temptation as was our Savior. We have no excuse. No one has had the temptation placed upon him or her like Christ did. No one. The parents of Jesus were poor and depended upon their daily toil. He was familiar with poverty, self-denial, and privation. This experience was a safeguard to him. In his industrious life, there were no idle moments to invite temptation. No aimless hours opened the way for corrupting associations. So far as possible, he closed the door to the tempter. Neither gain nor pleasure, applause nor censure, could induce him to consent to a wrong act. He was wise to discern evil and strong to resist it. We need that strength, we need that wisdom, we need to be praying for that, and we need to be keeping ourselves busy in the, in the work of the Lord or in some other um, honorable, noble, uh, industrial uh, position of some type that, um, that keeps us from getting tempted because, you know, idle hands, you know, what they say is the devil's workshop, right? We have no excuse. Christ was the only sinless one who ever dwelt on earth, yet for nearly 30 years he lived among the wicked inhabitants of Nazareth. This fact is a rebuke to those who think themselves dependent upon place, fortune, or prosperity in order to live a blameless life. Temptation, poverty, adversity is the very discipline needed to develop purity and firmness. So we need to, we need to um, come into a wealthy home and have everything that our heart desires. Is that what we really need? No, we need just the opposite, don't we? That's what we really need. Exactly what Christ had is what, uh, in, in bringing up in his uh, childhood, is exactly what we need. We need to have that, um, 
that type of, of life on this earth in order to prepare us properly for the, for, for the new world to come, right? The new life to come in heaven. Jesus lived in a peasant's home and faithfully and cheerfully acted his part in bearing the burdens of the household. How often do we see that today? How often do, are, we, are we cheerful about doing our hard, laborious work? We need to learn from Christ. He is our example. We need to pay attention here. He had been the commander of heaven, and angels had delighted to fulfill his word. Now he was a willing servant, a loving, obedient son. He was the commander of heaven. But now, he's a lowly child having to be bossed around and told what to do. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure Joseph was a, was a good man, but still, he was bossed around, right? He learned a trade and with his own hands worked in the carpenter's shop with Joseph. In the simple garb of a common laborer, he walked the streets of the little town, going to and returning from his humble work. He did not employ his divine power to lessen his burdens or to lighten his toil. Some may say, well, you know, he was, he was, uh, you know, he was a son of God. He was 100% uh, divine and 100% human, so he could just easily, you know, exercise his divinely powers and, uh, or divine powers and be able to do the work without it even bothering him in any way. But here we see clearly that he did not use his divine power to better himself. He never did. He only used it to better others. As Jesus worked in childhood and youth, mind and body were developed. He did not use his physical powers recklessly, but in such a way as to keep them in health that he might do the best work in every line. So is it possible, according to this, is it possible that he could have worked himself physically to a frazzle? That he could have injured his health if he hadn't, uh, hadn't have acted properly? I believe so, right? I mean, right here it says he made sure he didn't use his physical powers recklessly. He made sure that he was conservative in, in, um, in doing things properly. He was not willing to be defective, even in the handling of tools. He was perfect as a workman, as he was perfect in character. By his own example, he taught that it is our duty to be industrious. We are supposed to do things. We're supposed to work with our hands. That our work should be performed with exactness and thoroughness, and that such labor is honorable. The exercise that teaches, you know, this reminds me of some uh, comments that I've seen from Ellen White where she dealt with um, the youth in her day. I'm sure it's still the same today, um, especially the girls would think that it would be too strenuous on them physically to do anything. And so uh, they, and I, I know children today that still do the same thing, they work their parents to death, uh, getting this for them and caring for them here and there and everywhere, while they're s sitting on their laurels not doing anything. Um, even for children, it's good to be in some sort of activity, labor, producing something, and it really gives you a good sense of, of accomplishment and gives you a sense of, of life and what it's all about to help others and to, uh, to be working to improve things. The exercise that teaches the hands to be useful and trains the young to, to bear their share of life's burdens gives physical strength and develops every faculty. So important. All should find something to do that will be beneficial to themselves and helpful to others. God, you know, Jesus, he, he was all about service to others. God appointed work as a blessing. Work is a blessing. That almost just doesn't even sound right. I remember when I was a kid and, and my dad would, would make me do work around the house. You know, we did some mason work. We laid uh, bricks and things like that and, and uh, hauled, you know, we did um, uh, a lot of clearing of our property there in Calhoun, Georgia. And, and uh, it, was, it was hard work, you know, hauling brush and, and cutting trees and, and lifting heavy things. But um, you know what? I enjoy it today. I like getting out there and doing those things today. Um, I didn't like it so much then. I needed, I needed this teaching then uh, a little bit stronger, maybe. 
God appointed work as a blessing, and only the diligent worker finds the true glory and joy of life. Only, only the diligent worker finds the true glory and joy of life. That's, that's powerful. The approval of God rests with loving assurance upon children and youth who cheerfully take their part in the duties of the household, sharing the burdens of father and mother, helping them out, taking the, the weight of the burdens off of their parents. Such children will go out from the home to be useful members of society. Very important. We want to be useful members of society, don't we? Throughout his life on earth, Jesus was an earnest and constant worker. He expected much, therefore he attempted much. I think it's interesting that she used the word attempted. You know, it kind of gives way to maybe not everything he attempted he accomplished fully. You know, but he was willing to put in the effort and try, right? We need to do the same. After he had entered on his ministry, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work, John 9, 4. Jesus did not shirk care and responsibility as do many who profess to be his followers. It is because they seek to evade this discipline that so many are weak and inefficient. They may possess precious and amiable traits, but they are nevertheless, I'm sorry, they are nerveless and almost useless when difficulties are to be met or obstacles surmounted. The positiveness and energy, the, the uh, solidity and strength of character manifested in Christ are to be developed in us. The same traits, the same things of strength of character that Christ had, we need to be developing them in ourselves. And this, of course, is even more uh, critical for the younger generation. Through the same discipline that he endured and the grace that he received is for us. He received that grace, we should receive that grace as we do these things as well. So long as he lived among men, our Savior shared the lot of the poor. He knew by experience their cares and hardships. And obviously he did. And he could comfort and encourage all humble workers those who have a true conception of the teaching of his life will never feel that a distinction that a distinction must be made between classes. No distinction. The rich are to be honored above the worthy poor. Uh, wait a minute. That the rich are to be honored above the worthy poor is totally wrong. The rich, the wealthy, it's all, it doesn't matter, poor, um, disabled, healthy and well. God loves them all, and there should not be um, any distinction made between these different classes. Jesus carried into his labor cheerfulness and tact. It requires much patience and spirituality to bring Bible religion into the home life and into the workshop, to do both in the home life and in the workshop, to bear the strain of worldly business and yet keep the eye single to the glory of God. It requires much patience and spirituality. Much patience and spirituality. It's something that we need to strive towards each and every day. Bible religion into the home life and into the workshop, the worldly business, and still be able to keep our eye single to the glory of God. Those of us that are in the workforce out there, you know it's a struggle, isn't it? It's a struggle. This is where Christ was a helper. He was never so full of worldly care as to have no time or thought for heavenly things. He always kept his mind on heavenly things. Often he expressed the gladness of his heart by singing psalms and heavenly songs. Often the dwellers in Nazareth heard his voice raised in praise and thanksgiving to God. I think that's, that's wonderful. What a, what a testament. What, a, what an awesome example Christ is in this. Um, we need to have a song in our heart, a heavenly song. He held communi communion with heaven in song, and as his companions complained of weariness from labor, they were cheered by the sweet melody from his lips. His praise seemed to banish the evil angels and like incense fill the place with fragrance. The minds of his hearers were carried away from their earthly exile to the heavenly home. Isn't that beautiful? I think that's wonderful. 
how powerful it is to just have a, a joyful heart and to have um, a song, you know, to be uh, singing as we go throughout our day. Um, we need to learn from that. I do, personally. I know I do. Jesus was the fountain of healing mercy for the world, and through all those secluded years at Nazareth, his life flowed out in currents of sympathy and tenderness. The age, the sorrowing, and the sin burden, the children at play in their innocent joy, the little creatures of the groves, the patient beast of burden, all were happier for his presence. You know, they, they say that, um, uh, and I believe that it's true, that these people that are so wicked that they get some kind of pleasure out of hurting um, children or even adults, it starts with how they treated pets and animals and having, to, and having no disregard for, for their life, um, to be cruel and mean to animals, it starts there. Gaining pleasure from doing those types of horrible things. God created, Jesus created everything. Everything, you know, I, and I, I have to admit, when I was a kid, I, I wasn't the nicest to my sister's cat. I was kind of mean to my sister's cat. And, uh, you know, I, I'm so glad that, that, uh, that now, today, I don't, I don't want to kill anything. I'll see a, a worm on the ground, and, you know, if it's in the way, you know, in the sidewalk. I remember when we were, we used to uh, walk around in the apartment complex down there in Savannah where we, we stayed for a little while, and after it rained, there'd be all these worms on the sidewalk. And earthworms are great. They're very important. And I'd, we'd like, kick them off or, or push them off back over into the grass, you know. Um, but you get a new, a new appreciation for all living things that God has given to us and how important they all are to the ecosystem of the world, right? He whose word of, of power upheld the world would stoop to relieve a wounded bird. I mean, you're talking about the commander of heaven caring so much that uh, he would stoop down to help a wounded bird. Wow, that's, that's awesome. There was nothing beneath his notice, nothing to which he disdained to minister. Thus, as he grew in wisdom and stature, Jesus increased in favor with God and man. He drew the sympathy of all hearts by showing himself capable of sympathizing with all. The atmosphere of hope and courage that surrounded him made him a blessing in every home. And often in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, he was called upon to read the lesson from the prophets. When did he go to church? On Sabbath, always. And the hearts of the hearers thrilled as a new light shone out from the familiar words of the sacred text. From a little boy, from a very young little boy, reading the scriptures, and they would, they would actually get excited because new light, he would be shedding new light that they had, things that they hadn't understand, understood or perceived, he was able to reveal it. And we can do that as well. Yet Jesus shunned display. So, you know, whenever, you know, it's difficult sometimes when you're in a leadership position, uh, even as what Jesus was doing as a boy, um, sometimes, you know, you see, you see folks um, praising their children so much that they get what? They get haughty, right? They get puffed up. But Jesus didn't do that. During all the years his, of his stay in Nazareth, he made no exhibition of his miraculous power. He sought no high position and assumed no titles. His quiet and simple life and even the silence of the scriptures, scriptures concerning his early years teach an important lesson. That's powerful. Pay attention. The more quiet and simple the life of the child, the more free from artificial excitement and the more in harmony with nature, the more favorable is it to physical and mental vigor and to what? What kind of strength? Spiritual strength. Very important. He didn't care anything about um, any kind of uh, position or titles of any type. Jesus is our example. 
There are many who dwell with interest upon the period of his public ministry, while they pass unnoticed the teaching of his early years. And like I said before, there's not a whole lot in Scripture. There's not a whole lot of teaching in Scripture about his early years. But like we just saw here, the silence of the Scriptures concerning his early years teach us an important lesson. There wasn't a whole lot of excitement and pomp and display, right? It was simple but good and pure and noble and spiritual. It was excellent, uh, excellent lessons there. But it is in his home life that he is the pattern for all children and youth. The Savior condescended to poverty that he might teach how closely we in a humble lot may walk with God when we're humble. He lived to please, honor, and glorify his Father in the common things of life. His work began in consecrating the lowly trade of the craftsmen who toil for their daily bread. So is there anything wrong with, with working with your hands uh, in carpentry work and things of those nature, in that nature? Gardening maybe? Farming? No. It's very good. He was doing God's service just as much when laboring at the carpenter's bench as when working miracles for the multitude. Wow. He was doing just as much in God's service, either or. That's a great lesson for us. I mean, working miracles for the multitude. I mean, he went through towns and whole, healed the whole town of any ailments, any diseases that they had. That seems very high on the, part, the important list, right? It does to me. But here it says that he was doing just as much in God's service when he was working with his father, with his, I guess you could call him his stepfather, um, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the carpenter's shop there. Amazing. And every youth who follows Christ's example of faithfulness and obedience in his lowly home may claim those words spoken of him by the Father through the Holy Spirit. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. So every youth, every one that will follow Christ's example, this applies to them. Do you catch that? You catch that? Everyone of faithfulness, obedience in his lowly home may claim those words spoken of him by the Father through the Holy Spirit. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. Everyone, every one of us can have that accredited to us if we will just follow Christ's example. I pray that we do that in uh, our daily walks and in all that we do uh, during the week. And I pray that we do a little even more on the Sabbath day. Amen? Uh, God's holy day. We want to keep it holy and do the things that He wants us to do, especially on that day, but also, uh, also in, in our workaday life. We want to um, be an example to others there as well. All right, that is the end of this chapter. And uh, I think it was a great blessing. These, these chapters here are, are exciting they, uh, to me. They give us more insight into Christ's childhood. And the next one is going to be very powerful as well. And so I hope that, uh, that you will be back for that. All right, let's close with prayer at this time. <clears throat> Dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the lessons taught here. We thank you so much for the guidance that we have from your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and how he lived his life and how we should be living ours. Lord, help us. Uh, help us to, to pray. Uh, stay in a, a spirit of prayer, looking to heavenly things and not getting consumed by the temptations of the world as um, Jesus did such a wonderful job of giving us a great example there. Please help us to be more and more like him. Uh, lead and guide us, I pray. Help us to forsake the world and to um, just fall in love with, with our Savior, Jesus Christ, each and every day. And um, 
We pray and ask all things in His name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41.10